Hello everyone, uh, welcome back to our Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design. We have finally made our way up to the 1960s, where technology is starting to change what things look like a little bit. We're going to be seeing a little bit of changes as far as design, as well as some innovative technologies that we're going to see quite a bit of, especially as we move into the later decades. So the aircraft we're taking a look at here is the lovely Wilga. Uh, this is the uh, PZL-104. Uh, there's a lot of variations. Uh, we're looking at the Model 35 if you're looking for a specific version of this one. And we notice, uh, first of all, we have a completely different manufacturing of philosophies here. We have very, very different designs. Designs, and things are just a little different. Uh, one thing you'll notice, of course, is that we're starting to see the presence of digital electronics. Uh, we have a very, very basic radio system here, as well as a very, very basic ADF receiver. Uh, you'll notice here that this is a quite a big difference from uh, some of the stuff we've seen before. Other things we're going to notice here, again, a Polish design, so we're going to have some kind of simple different changes here, is we're still dealing with air-cooled engines, or we're still dealing with the radial engines. Uh, we can also see different pieces of carburetor temperature, RPM. You'll notice our instrumentation has started to get a little little different. Uh, you'll notice, for example, we have things like oil cooler shutters, uh, which is basically going to be providing us with all sorts of uh, cooling for our engines. You'll notice that this typical design that we saw all the way back as early as the 20s and 30s still exists in uh, Polish aircraft up through this particular era. Of course, uh, one of the interesting things you'll notice here is the presence of ergonomics. Our little stick here for helping control is actually tilted at an angle to make it easier for us to grab. You'll also notice the presence of our radio is right here. Uh, this particular one does not have uh, anything fancy as far as um, you know, fancy electronics or fancy navigational systems. And we still have a conventional generator setup. As a matter of fact, you'll notice if I pull the RPM back, our amperage basically drops negative as it starts pulling off the batteries. So a lot of that technology we saw is still out there. It just shows up in a slightly different way. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, give this thing full power. You know, one of the things that makes this aircraft uh, so incredible, it's such a good example of a uh, 60s design here, is you're starting to see some internal changes as well in the way that the aircraft is uh, designed to keep everything smooth. Once I get up in the air here, I'm going to pull my power back just a little bit so I don't have to uh, maybe set the engine or anything along those lines. You'll see we have a couple other things as well. You'll see we have both fuel tanks on this side. You'll notice that our materials, again, we're sticking to that metal. Our riveting has gotten much, 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 much better. You'll also notice the presence of things like counterweights in order to make the controls a little bit lighter to control. Uh, looking down at our wheels on the side, uh, this particular aircraft was intentionally designed to be an incredibly powerful workhorse. So the landing gear are just engineered. They're built. And you can see just how large our almost full moving tail is uh, sitting there over the back. The other thing you're going to start noticing the presence of is high lift devices. Uh, you'll notice that we have a bunch of slats running along the leading edge of our wing here. Uh, we did have slats for a very, very long time, but now we're starting to see them installed in typical civilian aircraft. Again, this is almost a typical because of its uh, performance as well as kind of the different properties of it. Other things we're starting to notice a little bit different, and these show up quite often. Is, uh, you'll notice that everything is concentrated by system now. You'll notice all of our electronics are sort of all isolated in one area. You'll notice that our engine instruments are all controlled in one area. You'll notice that our primary flight controls, which start to look a little familiar, are all concentrated in one area. Other things we're going to notice now that the technology continues to improve here is you're going to see things like HSIs become much more prevalent. You know, they're much, much better tools. A directional gyro is almost universally. We'll still have a backup compass if we need it. But the key thing here is it's not as critical because we have backup instruments we can now utilize for those tools. Uh, you also see a prevalence of instruments uh, for using all sorts of instrument flying. Not so much in this one. Uh, we had ADF capability in this particular airplane. Uh, we didn't have uh, other abilities until a little bit later on. But you're also noticing that the engine management side of things is still relatively involved. And again, engine management starts to get better once we get up into the 80s when you start seeing FADAC. Uh, but we're not going to see that right away. So we're still going to be sitting here cranking our oil shutters and our cooling shutters and doing a lot of that work manually for us. Now, the other thing you're not going to see even in this early 1960s generation is going to be any technology such as autopilot in airplanes this small. It's not to say they did not have autopilot in airplanes this small. It's just to say that was more of an airline luxury. It wasn't really something we would see in a general aviation plane. And again, I started our little discussion here with something a little bit simpler. You also notice the prevalence of things like uh, using more plastics in the design. You're going to see uh, basically using welds more often as opposed to basically mechanical connections. A lot of that has all changed. Uh, even the exterior structure of the aircraft has started to improve slightly. We're seeing standardization in lights. We're seeing standardization in aircraft tire types. All of these things are starting to get a little bit better on now that you know, the technology is starting to evolve. This aircraft, by the way, is 1962. But when it came to 1960s innovations, one of the biggest innovations that actually came out a few years earlier was just making its way into general aviation. What is that strange sound we hear? Ah. 
almost like a hissing or a whining sound. Why is the nose so long? Yes, the turboprop. Uh, believe it or not, the gas turbine's been around a little bit longer than uh, this particular aircraft, for sure. Uh, this level of the aircraft is a PC-6. This is a turbo porter. This is a 1961. So it's actually newer than our buddy that we saw a minute ago. Uh, the cool thing we have here now is a different type of propulsion. Uh, the gas turbines are much, much more powerful by weight than anything else. And of course, uh, once we started getting turboprop aircraft, we started creating this weird zone between kind of general aviation and light commercial slash air taxi, and it all sort of split apart. But uh, one of the things you'll notice here too is I kind of look down. Obviously, this has been modernized. Now we have ourselves a GPS over here. We wouldn't have had any of this good stuff. Is you're going to notice that our instruments are still kind of blown all around the place. And I actually noticed uh, kind of hilariously here that uh, whoever was responsible for calibrating this instrument a minute ago, it didn't do the greatest of jobs there. They let the little needle basically shoot off the top. We can live with that. But one of the things you'll notice now is we have things like percentage of RPM gauges. Uh, we have a torque meter. We have interstage turbine temperature meters. And everything is still kind of got that sort of brute force nature to it. Uh, you'll notice our throttles are these big chunky affairs. Uh, you'll notice that our kind of hatches and controls are just kind of dealing all over the place. We got wires for different brakes and servo actuators. Everything is just very, very much uh, still kind of has that brute force look to it. Uh, one thing you'll see, of course, is that we still have the presence of all the circuit breakers, which are all nice and detailed out in front of us like that. We have internal fuel gauges now, which is good. We're running on alternators, which works. I'm actually running a little bit low power. I can actually kick this thing up a little bit and I try to get it going just fast enough to actually start producing some electricity. Of course, uh, with the introduction of turboprops uh, came a whole new host of things we had to start to worry about as pilots. Uh, one thing we had to start being really, really concerned with, for example, is that we had to not over torque things. Uh, we also had to deal with, you know, all the other, you know, kind of the way this engine races. We had to work with all sorts of new filtration systems. And with the innovation of this particular type, we saw a lot of this come out. And uh, we'll actually see a couple years later that as the turboprops got progressively more powerful, not only did we see them in smaller craft like this, but you started seeing things, things like the Dash 7 or like the Dash 8. And you started seeing these commuter aircraft that had turboprop capabilities. Uh, one of the incredible things is, is they just went ahead and threw a turboprop on the front of that thing, and they kept the fixed landing gear for the purposes of trying to improve uh, basically performance. Again, this is a cargo version of this uh, particular aircraft, so it's a uh, there back there. Control wise, you'll notice they maintain the stick, which is actually very similar to what we had before. But you'll notice again quite a bit of material changes. Uh, we're still getting a bunch of metal, but notice our riveting is getting progressively better. Notice the presence of large counterweights here. Uh, notice the fact that we have nice electric uh, flaps. Uh, we don't have slats in this particular model, but it would not be an unusual thing to encounter aircraft like this. Other things we have, of course, so which we definitely did not have in the past, is that we have constant speed propellers, which uh, when we're dealing with uh, the wonderful land of turbo props here, it gives us kind of unique ability to actually bring the noise down is uh, usually what I like to joke about as far as uh, what happens on turboprops when you pull the blue handle. But all of these innovations made a really big difference. And uh, the incredible thing is, especially for this plane, the PC-6, is you'll actually see this plane all the way through modern times because the basic style and basic design of it is so effective and so efficient that it really didn't need a lot of changing, even though it's 1960s technology. And uh, another thing you're probably going to notice or probably observe as well is a lot of these 1950s and 60s planes exist in some form in modern times only because of what comes up in the 1980s, which is uh, when we get to that decade, uh, you'll all know exactly what happened during that point. But other things you'll start to notice is uh, the idea that we're going to have a controller that's going to have a lot of buttons on it to make it a little bit safer for us to control. You'll notice that uh, we have more flexible electrical systems on board so we can uh, plug things in and out. We have the presence of trim indicators, uh, something we had depending on what airplane that you had. Notice enunciators, uh, something we didn't have a lot of uh, coming into this point. Now we have little idiot lights to kind of remind us uh, what different parts of the airplane functionality are going to be doing. Notice our radio systems got better. Again, this would be an atypical radio system for this particular plane in 1961. But you also see other planes like this, and those radial engines uh, suddenly became a little bit less popular. Now, at this point, a lot of people are going to say, but um, why did you not include any jets? Yeah, jets is a pretty big deal. Uh, like I said in the beginning, uh, we're trying to concentrate more on the smaller airplanes. Here are the jets and commercial and all that. That is its own beast that uh, we could explore in great detail on another series of videos. So one of the things I like to demonstrate, and uh, we did this a few times back in the 20s and 30s, was the fact that when you pull the throttle back on airplanes, I mentioned that aerodynamics had improved substantially. So watch what happens when I pull the throttle all the way back on this one. 
Now, when we did this on our earlier planes, the plane basically dropped out of the sky. And you'll notice our plane is decelerating very, very rapidly. And again, it's got a constant speed propeller, which is going a little bit fine pitch right now. But it takes a moment for the aircraft to actually start coming down to slow uh, because the drag is so reduced in modern aircraft, even with these massive wheels dangling off the bottom, that we're still able to maintain a little bit of that forward motion when we start our deceleration process. And you can see how that aerodynamic harmony that's uh, starting to change things is also adjusted. Another thing you probably observe, uh, if you're looking really, really closely, is that when I'm taking my turns here, I don't need to work the controls nearly as hard with the rudder especially. If you take a look over there on my turn bank coordinator, I am basically one toe braking, or one toe uh, rudder control this plane because of how simple it is. Performance, of course, is so powerful in turboprop airplanes, and this is a known issue with all turboprop planes, is if I were to level this sucker off and go ahead and uh, push the throttle back forward up to our limit of torque right there, you will see that I can actually overspeed the plane in level flight. Now remember just a few years back, we didn't even have airspeed indicators. Now not only do we have airspeed indicators, but we actually have so much available thrust in aircraft like this that we can actually exceed its design limits uh, just basically in level flight like this, just to give you an idea of how powerful this is. And again, this is early 1960s technology. And it just to give you an idea of just how incredible it is. Now, when we get into the 70s, things are going to change a little bit for us for aircraft designs. There's going to be a lot of external forces that are going to start really impacting what it is that people are going to want in an airplane, as well as the competition itself. But that will be for our next video in the series of Microsoft Flight Simulator Evolution of Aircraft Design. Enjoy.